Okay, so we're going to talk today about another type of objective test. So, autoacoustic emissions and auditory evoked potentials are objective measures of the cochlea and the auditory nerve. If you remember our objective test of the middle ear, it's tympanometry. With objective tests, the subject is not involved. They just have to sit passively and quietly. So these are important tests for audiology because we can find out how someone's cochlea is performing and how their auditory nerve is performing without the subject actually participating. The first type of autoacoustic emission that we're going to talk about are spontaneous autoacoustic emissions. So autoacoustic emissions, the name might help you understand what's going on. Oto means ear, acoustic means sound, and emission would be something coming out, right? So we have sounds coming out of the ear, autoacoustic emissions. Um, if you remember how your cochlea processes sound, they the sounds enter, you know, through the middle ear. There's this wave of fluid that triggers these outer hair cells, and the outer hair cells move up and down. And when the outer hair cells move up and down, they create some extra energy, and that extra energy is what we measure as our autoacoustic emissions. So the first type of autoacoustic emissions are spontaneous OAEs. And these are just produced by the cochlea in the absence of sound. So these are just sounds that are in your ear. And they're very, very, very soft sounds. So you don't hear these sounds. It's not like uh, tinnitus when your ears ring after you leave a concert or a loud, you know, a loud music show. These are super soft sounds that are in your ear that can only be recorded with a very, very sensitive microphone. And not everybody has them. Only about half the population with normal hearing. You have to have normal hearing to have OEs. So only half the population with normal hearing has these sounds. And they usually are around 1,000 to 3,000 hertz. Okay, so they're about a mid-frequency sound, and they have an amplitude that is very soft, of negative 10 dB to 10 dB. So like I said, you can't hear these sounds, and not everybody has them. So they're not super useful because not everyone has them, um, so, you know, they don't, and they, they just sort of occur, um, they, they don't help us too much in audiology, but it's interesting to know that we have these super soft sounds. Now, evoked OAEs are very important for audiology because this is like the basis of newborn hearing screening. This is an objective test for us to know how that cochlea is performing. So with evoked autoacoustic emissions, I evoke the sounds out of my ear. So I will send a stimuli in that will trigger the outer hair cells to start to move up and down to process the sound and then I can record that extra energy with a very sensitive microphone. Okay, So these are different from spontaneous. These are evoked. I put a probe in a person's ear, I send sound in through the probe, and I can record the outer hair cells response to the sound. And this occurs in all people that have normal hearing. There are two types of evoked autoacoustic emissions, transient evoked autoacoustic emissions and distortion product evoked autoacoustic emissions. And the only difference between the two types of evoked emission is the stimuli that's used to evoke them. So with transient emissions, a click goes in, like click, 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 click. With a distortion product OEs, you have two pure tones that go in. But other than that, it's the same idea behind both of them. The sound is sent in to the cochlea. The outer hair cells begin to process that sound. In the processing of their sound, they measure there's some extra energy produced, and that extra energy is measured by a very sensitive microphone. So autoacoustic emissions are important for the differential diagnosis of sensory neural hearing loss. Autoacoustic emissions help me figure out if the problem, if the sensory neural hearing loss, remember, a sensory neural hearing loss occurs in the cochlea or the auditory nerve. So OEs help me figure out, is the problem in the cochlea or the auditory nerve? So the differential diagnosis, figuring out where in the inner ear the hearing loss is. OEs are great for newborn hearing screening. Before OEs, 
We didn't know if a child had hearing loss until they were like a year or two old when they weren't speaking, when they weren't having any words. And there's a huge amount of time missed and a huge amount of brain development missed between birth and one or two years old. So OAEs have really changed the game with early diagnosis. When we have early diagnosis, we can have cochlear implantation and intervention, and we can change the game for these kids. So the way OAEs work with um, newborn hearing screening is all babies are screened before they leave the hospital. It's state mandated. Every state has a mandate. It's very easy to do. A probe is put in the infant's ear. Sounds are sent in. If the cochlea makes that extra energy, then the recording will be made and the infant will pass the newborn hearing screening. It's just a simple screen. It's very quick and efficient, and it's, um, it's, it's amazing that we know now before a child and infant leaves the hospital if they have a hearing loss. OAEs are also great for difficult to test populations. For example, um, a child that has uh, autism and can't participate fully in a test, you can get OAEs on that child, and if you get OAEs, you know that the child's cochlea is at least functioning properly. OAEs can also be used to monitor outer, health, outer hair cell function when there are ototoxic medications. So ototoxic medications are medications that are toxic to the ear. Some cancer medications may be toxic. And what you could do with OAEs is you can monitor the strength of an OAE as a person is getting this medicine. And as they're getting the medicine, the strength of their OAE would weaken or might weaken. And a weakening OAE would be representative of a hearing loss. So transient evoked autoacoustic emissions are produced after a brief acoustic stimuli, so a click or a tone is presented to the ear. So you, the person would have to sit quietly, the probe would be placed snugly in their ear, and there would be a click, 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 click sound. That sound would travel in through the middle ear to the cochlea, and it would cause the outer hair cells to move up and down. The outer hair cells are going to make some extra energy. The energy is going to be captured by the microphone, and there's going to be signal averaging to separate out the admission from the ongoing noise. So you have about 260 to 500 stimuli that are presented, and um, what we do is we, we get an, an average. So the OAE should stand above the regular noise in the ear, and you get that through signal averaging. So we collect a lot of measures, and we're able to pull out the OAE over the noise in the ear. All people with normal hearing have evoked OAEs. Okay, so if you have normal hearing, I can get a measure of these sounds coming out of your ear. Remember, this is, this is how we do newborn hearing screening. If an infant has otoacoustic emissions, it means that their cochlea is working properly. It doesn't mean that their auditory nerve is working properly, and it doesn't mean that their brain is making sense of sounds, but at least the audiologist knows that the cochlea is performing properly. So for these, these infants with newborn hearing screening, um, the sound has to travel through the outer ear, through the middle ear, and into the cochlea, and the response has to come out, back, through the middle ear, into the outer ear canal where it's measured. Um, if you get a, a pass response, the parents get a certificate that says your baby passed the newborn hearing screening, but it doesn't guarantee that your infant will have normal hearing because this test does not test the auditory nerve and because a lot of things can happen to that infant between birth and when they're, you know, an older child that could interfere with their hearing. But OAEs are, like I said, a real game changer when it came to newborn hearing screening. Um, with the OAEs, so like I said, they're present in norm all people that have normal hearing. And as your 
hearing loss, let's say you had like a moderate hearing loss or a mild hearing loss, I would still get OAEs from you, but they wouldn't be as strong. And as your hearing loss would get gets worse, like say you have presbycusis and you're getting older and your hearing loss is getting worse and it's the, your thresholds are worse than 40 dB or worse than 45 dB onward, you know, so greater than 40 dB you have this hearing loss, I won't get an OAE response. I won't get a TEOE response. So the response disappears with your hearing loss. So the response may be very, very robust when you're a young person and you have normal hearing thresholds, but as you age and your thresholds get worse, the response is going to get weaker and weaker until there is no response. So for a 65-year-old man with presbycusis, um, with your know, moderate to severe presbycusis, I wouldn't get any TEOAEs. And that's a sign that the cochlea is damaged. So when you don't get an OAE response, a TEOAE or a DPOAE, the cochlea is damaged. Okay, so if we do get a response, what, that, what we can infer is that through the pinna, through the middle ear, because remember the evoking stimuli has to travel through the middle ear, up to the cochlea, everything isn't, is in good shape. I think I have a pen here. Okay, let me just draw this out for you guys. So here's your ear canal. And then we have your tympanic membrane, and your middle ear space. And then you have your cochlea, okay? And then remember beyond our cochlea, we have our auditory nerve. So here's our auditory nerve. Okay, so your middle ear is supposed to be filled with air, remember? So sounds come in, they go through your middle ear, to your cochlea. Your cochlea has these outer hair cells all along them. The outer hair cells move up and down in response to sound. So if we get an OAE, that means sound has come in through the ear canal, through the middle ear, to the cochlea, where some energy has been created, and then it has been traveled out through the middle ear, back to the probe where it was recorded. So TEOEs or DPOEs mean that this is good, this is good, and this is good. But they don't test to the auditory nerve, so they don't guarantee normal hearing. Okay, when a TEOE is not seen, it suggests that a hearing loss is present. Um, for example, if there was a 60 dB hearing loss, like I said, if there was an older person with presbycusis, then they might not have these TEOEs, depending on the severity. Now, an absent TEOE does not reveal whether the problem is in the conductive pathway or the sensory neural pathway. Why would that be? Let's think about it. Let's go back to my picture. So I have, oops, I'm sorry. I have my, my pinna, my ear canal, my middle ear space, my cochlea. Okay. Sounds has to travel through the ear canal to the middle ear. What happens if the middle ear is out of commission? What happens if the middle ear has fluid in it? If the middle ear has fluid in it, sounds are not going to be able to get from the outer ear canal to the cochlea, and you could get a failed TEOE. So an absent TEOE, the problem could be here, in that the sound is not getting through to the cochlea, or the problem could be in the cochlea. But what test could we use to figure out if this is the problem? Tympanometry, remember, tympanometry tests the middle ear. So if you get a normal tymp and an absent OAE, 
then you know the problems in the cochlea. But you have to get a normal tip. Okay? So like I said, with audiology, everything sort of should fall into place to help you see the big picture. Okay? So we did pure tones. We do speech. We do tympanometry and the acoustic reflex. Now we're doing autoacoustic emissions to test the cochlea. And at the end of this PowerPoint, we're going to talk about ABR to test the auditory nerve. <coughs> okay, so another type of evoked OAE is the distortion product OAE. And the distortion product OAE is um, similar to the TEOE in that it's present in all people with normal hearing. The sound is evoked. So instead of a click that we use for TEOE, Two primary tones that are close in frequency are sent into the cochlea and um, the cochlea responds again those outer hair cells by moving up and down and they produce some additional energy that we measure as the DPOAE. So we can change around the primary tone frequencies and we can test different areas of the cochlea based on our primary tone combination. So this doesn't rule out a hearing loss from 40 to 50. So if you have um, a hearing loss at 45 dB, I can still get a weak DPOE. But if your hearing loss is at 55 dB, I'm not going to get a DPOE. So OAEs, you have a probe just like you did with tympanometry. And this has um, two parts, a miniature loudspeaker to send the sound in and a very tiny, very, very sensitive microphone to pick the sound up. Subject noise level is critical. So believe it or not, your body is a very noisy place. You just don't hear that noise because you have a very effective middle ear. But your body is a very noisy place, so any chewing or swallowing or crying is going to mask these super soft sounds. So you have to do this test when the baby is quietly sleeping or when the child is um, quietly distracted because any, any noise, any background noise is going to affect your test results. Like I said, OAEs reflect the activity of an intact cochlea. So OAEs measure normal outer hair, outer hair cell function. And the conductive pathway must be normal. So you're not going to get an OAE if the infant has fluid in its ear. Because the strength of the signal, both back and forth from the outer ear to the inner ear, can be attenuated or lessened by an abnormality in the middle ear. So newborn babies are born with fluid in their ears. And it's um, that fluid in the ear is going to affect our test results. So babies will fail this test not because they have a cochlear hearing loss, which is pretty serious, but because they have fluid in their ear. So you have to be cautious when you do this test on newborn babies. You have to make sure that the vernix or that um, soft you know, covering that they're born with is cleaned off and if you give them a little bit of time, their ears will drain out and you'll get a better test result. So newborn babies tested at 24 hours will perform worse than newborn babies tested at 48 hours because the more time you can give that infant, the more time it gives their middle ear to clear out and the more um, trustworthy results you're going to get, okay? So to do an OAE, the conductive pathway should be normal. Unless you're not going to be able to get the sound in to evoke the OAE. The presence of an autoacoustic emissions suggests that there is very little or no conductive hearing loss caused by middle ear abnormality because the sound had to travel through the middle ear and back out. And it suggests that the responding frequency regions of the cochlea are normal or exhibit no more than a mild hearing loss, okay? Mild to moderate hearing loss. So um, this is fine for adults, but another drawback with OEEs, and we're working on it in the research, is figuring out how can we make this test even more sensitive 
so that we can pick up those mild hearing losses. Because even a mild hearing loss is going to affect an infant's ability to learn speech and language. Okay, if OEEs are present and there is a sensory neural hearing loss, as determined by the audiogram, then the outer hair cell function is intact. The locus or the area of the disorder would be retrocochlear or beyond the cochlea. So this is what we're going to talk about in the next next stage. Again, like I said, this is one of the reasons they really like audiology is because you have to think about all the pieces that come together. So um, sensory neural hearing losses, where do they occur? In the cochlea or the auditory nerve? Let's say you're doing your OE test and you have a normal OAE, okay? A normal OAE, but your audiogram says you have a sensory neural hearing loss. Where's the problem? In the auditory nerve. So how do we test the auditory nerve now? Well, I'll tell you. We use the ABR. Okay. Oh, wait, that's not in my next slide. So <laughs> if the OEs are absent and there is a sensory neural hearing loss and the middle ear is normal, then you know that the problem is cochlear, in the cochlea. Okay? But we still have to check retrocochlear. We still have to check beyond the cochlea. We have to check the auditory nerve and make sure that the auditory nerve is okay. So we use auditory evoked potential. So we've done the pinna. We use tympanometry to test the middle ear. We used OEs to test the cochlea. And now we're using the auditory brainstem response or auditory evoked potentials to test the auditory nerve. So um, acoustic stimuli is transferred to the brain as a series of neuroelectric events or electrical impulses, not necessarily sound. And there are um, different, different and changing sounds produce ongoing electrical activity in the brain. And this is another objective measure of hearing sensitivity. So objective measures mean that the subject is not involved. So this is another test, the ABR, where um, the subject doesn't have to do anything but sit passively. Okay. So auditory evoked potentials are electrical responses that are recorded from the scalp using surface electrodes. Uh, Dr. Wagner, if any of you have Dr. Wagner or um, Dr. Yan, she has, they both do this, these auditory evoked potentials. So uh, the brainstem is connected to the auditory cortex through a series of way stations within the central nervous system. A signal is presented to the ear. There is an electrical response from the cochlea. The signal is propagated along the auditory pathway and time elapses during this propagation. Thus, the signal can be recorded from the, each subsequent nucleus on its pathway to the brain. Just want to hop ahead and see if I added this picture. I don't think I did. Okay, so let me just draw a picture for you. I'm sure you like my drawings. Not that good, right? I'm trying my best. Uh, this is my chalkboard. Anyway, so let's say you have a cochlea over here, right? You have two cochleas on each side of your brain. Here are your eyes. And then you have your nose and your mouth, okay? And then there's your right side cochlea and your left side cochlea. Sounds come in. What happens? They get, they go up. They get processed, they get shared over, they get processed, they get processed, they get up, 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 all the way up so you have a big brain, up to your auditory cortex, okay? So what we can do right now is as they're getting processed, um, there's, they're getting propagated. They're moving up along your auditory nerve to your auditory cortex. And Time passes as they move up along, as these electrical impulses, these electrical responses move up your brain. And we can measure the movement of these things up your brain. And that's called auditory evoked response, auditory evoked potential. So they start here with the ABR and they go up and they go up and they go up all the way to your auditory cortex. 
and we measure the time it takes for them to get up those ways. Okay, so ABR8, auditory evoked potentials, this is our umbrella term for what we're talking about right now, can be subdivided on the basis of where they occur along the auditory pathway. And we can measure the time between when we send the signal in and when we see a wave response. And we can measure the amplitude or the strength, the magnitude of those responses, okay? So with auditory evoked potentials, we're measuring the time when they occur and we're measuring the strength of their responses. So the first auditory evoked potentials occur from 0 to 10 or 15 milliseconds and they occur in the 8th cranial nerve and the brainstem and this is called the ABR. This is what I keep referring to. So the ABR is the test that we know most about and it's the test that is standard for audiology. The other tests that I'm going to briefly mention are done in research. People are still studying them but the ABR is pretty standard. And it's a standard part of our auditory test battery. Well, it's not always a standard part, I shouldn't say that. It's a very common tool used in audiology, but it's not part of the complete audiological evaluation. So like I said, that auditory evoked potentials is our umbrella term for ABR, the auditory middle latency response, the late response, and the event-related potentials. But the ABR is most important for our class right now. It's most important for audiology. And it occurs in the first 10 to 15 milliseconds after the signal is presented to the ear. It originates in the eighth cranial nerve in our auditory nerve. And it occurs pretty early after the stimulus is presented. Now, if we go up, 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 up further along the process to the midbrain, at 15 to 60 milliseconds, we get the auditory middle latency response. We get the auditory late response. Don't memorize these times that this happened. I'm not going to ask you at what millisecond does the auditory late response occur. This isn't important. I just want you to get the general idea that we have electrical impulses processing the sound headed all the way up to our auditory cortex. The ABR is what most important for speech, and that's what I want you to focus on. Well, not speech for audiology, obviously. But um, some professors in our apartment do research on the auditory late responses and the auditory event-related potentials, also known as the, the P300. So how do we measure these? Well, there's a lot of electrical activity happening on our scalp. And the EEG, so what we're doing is we're basically measuring like electrical impulses on our brain. And it doesn't hurt. It's done with an EEG. So um, EEGs are used to pick up and amplify electrical activity from the brain with electrodes placed on the scalp. When changes in activity are observed, waveforms can be seen. And this aids in the diagnosis of central nervous system diseases or abnormalities. And for us, what we do is um, we use them to measure our auditory evoked responses. So little electrodes are placed on your head and then EEG picks up the neural responses, amplifies them, stores them in time bins, sums them, separates them out from the noise. Okay, so random brain activity is canceled out and your brain, these waves are um, averaged and pulled forward. So we have an electrode placed on the mastoid, the large bone behind your ear, your vertex, the top of your skull, and one placed on your forehead. And then a probe is put in a person's ear and clicks are sent in. And then we measure the waves going on up. So each wave represents the neuroelectric activity at one or more sites along the auditory brain pathway. So we've got, these are our most important waves are waves one through five. So wave one, two, three, four, and five we're going to look for. We're going to look for the latency, so the time between wave one and two, or wave one and three, three and four, four and five, they should all occur around the same time. We have standards now for what is considered a normal response time and what's a delayed response time. And we're going to look at the strength of the waves. Particularly, we're going to look at the strength of wave five, so the amplitude of wave five, 
Wave five would be your strongest wave and the last wave to disappear. So over here, I know this looks like a mess, right? So we have wave one, here's wave two, wave three, wave four is like right here, and wave five. I know it's hard to pick these out, but um, they're standard. So, and audiologists are trained to do this. So they know the time frame when wave one is supposed to occur, wave, when, when wave two is going to occur, when wave three, when four, and five. And they have, they're able to pick them out because they, you know, have a lot of experience with this. And the computer helps them, helps them find where wave one, two, three, four, and five should be. So to do an ABR, the patient is seated in a chair in a quiet room. The skin is cleaned so that you could get like a good impedance match. The electrodes are placed. Here you go. Okay, so you see this man is, uh, there's the audiologist on the computer collecting the ABR waves. There's your ABR equipment. And then the man is sitting here. He has his probe in his ear sending um, tones in. And I guess you can't see the electrodes, but you'd have an electrode here, an electrode up on the top of his scalp, and an electrode behind his ear. So the electrodes are taped and placed, and then an impedance measure, impedance, uh, measure is taken, and the impedance measure just makes sure that the electrode is as close to the scalp as it can get, and your skin is clean and not oily, and you can, you know, so the EEG can get a good response. Like I said, an earphone is placed in the test ear, and then a bunch of clicks are presented at a pretty loud level, 70 dB normal hearing, that's a loud level. And so it's like click, 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 very fast, very loud. The sounds are sent through the pinna, through the middle ear, through the cochlea, to the auditory nerve, and the responses are measured through the electrodes on the scalp. So the response waves are then measured through the electrodes on the scalp. Like I said, there are a lot of clicks sent in very fast at a starting level of 70 dB normal hearing. And the ABR wave appears as several narrow peaks and troughs within the first one to 10 milliseconds of the signal onset. The main positive peaks are labeled one through five. Those are our important waves. If a response isn't present at 70 dB, the audiologist will automatically raise the level of the clicks to 90 dB, which is a very loud sound. So the ABR is used as a diagnostic site of lesion test. It is sensitive, it is specific, it is efficient in detecting cancers affecting the auditory pathway in the brainstem. It's useful in detecting medium to large eighth nerve tumors. A complete ABR is going to find the latency or the time when all five of those waves occur. The latency in between the waves, the inner peak latencies, the strength, the amplitude of the waves, and the threshold, the lowest level that wave five is still visible. Okay, so let me go into a little bit more detail. The ABR, remember this is a, a test of auditory evoked potentials. This is the one that occurs in the auditory nerve. The ABR is most important for audiology. The ABR can be used to test audiological function and neurological function. So the ABR is also used as a test of newborn hearing screening. And it's an even better test of newborn hearing screening than otoacoustic emissions because it tests the auditory nerve. So now you can test up through the auditory nerve, which is even better than testing at the cochlea. The uh, the ABR can, use, can be used to find a threshold of hearing. So um, the ABR tests a frequency range between 2,000 hertz and 4,000 hertz. And from there, it can be inferred the lowest intensity at which um, someone's behavioral threshold is. Okay, so let me 
try another picture. I hope this helps. So you're going to be sending in these sounds and you get wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, wave five. Okay. And the audiologist is going to see the latency of those waves and the amplitude. Latency means time. Okay, everybody. So this is hard to write. This is the latency over here. So when each wave occurs and the strength of the wave. So the audiologist sends the evoking stimuli in, right? There's a probe in the ear canal, sound goes in through the middle ear, through the cochlea, up to the auditory nerve, and those responses are measured, okay? So here's our auditory nerve. We measure the electrical responses, their latency and their amplitude. Wave five, the last wave. The audiologist is going to watch the amplitude of wave 5. So initially this is sent in at 70 dB, which is a loud sound, okay? Then the audiologist will lower it, or can lower it, to 60 dB. I'm sorry. The audiologist can lower it to 60 dB, and the audiologist can lower it to 50 dB, and 40 dB, and 30 dB. And as the audiologist makes the evoking stimuli softer and softer, these waves are going to start to disappear. When the last wave to disappear is going to be wave 5, when wave 5 disappears, that's 20 decibels away from the person's actual behavioral threshold. So let's say um, an infant fails the cochlea OAE test, okay? So they fail the OAE test, so then they have to come back for further testing. The further testing that they're going to get is the auditory nerve test, the ABR. And the audiologist will start at a level of 70 dB, and she's going to look for wave 5. If she gets a wave 5, she's going to go down to 60 dB. She's going to look for wave 5. If she gets um, wave 5, she's going to go down to 50 dB. That's great. If she gets wave, if she gets at fifty, she's going to go down to forty. If she can get it at forty decibels, that means that the child's hearing threshold is twenty dB. Perfect, normal, good to go. The child does not have hearing loss. If the audiologist can't get a response at seventy dB, she's going to go up to ninety dB. She's going to look for that wave five. If she doesn't see any waves. That's an indication that the child is deaf, okay? So when there are no waves present at a very loud level, 70 dB, 90 dB, the child's auditory nerve is not firing, and the child is deaf. So that's how ABRs can be used to test audiological function. Oh, look, I just explained in the next slide. So the audiologist is looking for wave 5, the lowest level that wave 5 can be inferred, the lowest level that wave 5 can be inferred is usually within 10 to 20 decibels of a person's actual behavioral threshold. Okay, so ABR can be used to test threshold. It can also be used to test neurological site of lesion. So it could also be used to test for the health of the auditory nerve. So an increase in latency of the peaks, which indicates a slower response, could be due to a tumor mass weighing on the auditory nerve or an abnormal central nervous system disorder such as multiple sclerosis. Okay, so remember I said with an ABR, let me go back to my pen. So this time the audiologist isn't looking at the amplitude of the waves, the strength of the waves, She's more concerned with the timing of the waves, okay, the latency. And we have norms for this. So we expect wave 1 to occur at a certain time. We expect wave 2 to occur at a certain time. We expect wave 3 to occur at a certain time. We expect wave 4 at a certain time. We expect wave 5 at a certain time. If wave 1 doesn't occur until here, 
or when two is not there and three is over there, if the waves occur at a time, that, if the waves are slow, if they're not occurring when they're supposed to be occurring, that could be a sign that there's a growth on the auditory nerve that is slowing the wave down or multiple sclerosis. There's something happening that's affecting the timing of the waves. Okay, so when the latencies of the waves are prolonged or the interval between the timing of the waves are prolonged, that's a sign that one ear, um, that things are slow, something's wrong. If one ear is much slower than the other ear, that's a sign that there's a growth on one side and not the other side. Okay, so like everything I said, if the amplitude ratios are abnormal, if the latencies are abnormal, if wave five is prolonged, um, they're all signs that there's something wrong with the auditory nerve. And then here would be a growth on the auditory nerve, okay? So um, to review, OAEs are tested, test the movement of the outer hair cell function of the cochlea. ABR, it tests the auditory nerve, it tests latency, the timing of the wave firing, and it tests the amplitude or the strength of the waves. Um, ABRs can be used for an auditory behavioral threshold. So you can find the threshold of someone's hearing using an ABR, or you could test their neurological function by looking at the latency of the waves.